In these closing days of the Bush administration, the nuclear industry is still trying to revive itself largely through the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, or GNIP. This program, promoted by the U.S. Department of Energy, is trying to expand nuclear power use worldwide. One barrier to this expansion is the still unresolved issue of what to do with the 50,000 plus tons of dangerous and highly radioactive spent fuel created by U.S. reactors. Scientists at DOE are proposing that the U.S. deal with the waste situation by a method called reprocessing. The nuclear industry likens reprocessing to recycling, but critics charge this is greenwashing of a highly polluting and uneconomic waste disposal scheme. Our guest today is Dr. Ivan Ulrich, Vice President for Strategic Security Programs at the Federation of American Scientists in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ulrich will provide answers to the many questions surrounding the problems of radioactive waste disposal and also will explain why the Federation has taken a strong position opposing the reprocessing of the irradi irradiated spent nuclear fuel. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I guess we should start by just some background of yourself and tell us a little bit about the Federation. Um, the Federation of American Scientists was founded uh, just a couple of months after the uh, use of the atomic bombs in World War II. It was founded, it was originally the Federation of Atomic Scientists, what today would be called nuclear physicists, uh, that had worked on the Manhattan Project to develop the world's first nuclear weapons. And they were very concerned about the uh, political and moral and military implications of the work that they had done. They thought that the public and the press and politicians should be aware of what that, and also scientists should be aware. And uh, then in the spring of 1946, it was decided to expand the membership beyond those people who had actually worked on the Manhattan Project. So the Federation of Atomic Scientists became the Federation of American Scientists. We've worked toward transparency in uh, nuclear research and uh, working toward the elimination of nuclear weapons ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, how long have you been on this issue? Uh, I've been at the Federation of American Scientists for about six years, but I did my graduate work in nuclear physics and I've been involved in arms control, uh, su you know, technical support for arms c control negotiations for the federal government uh, for, you know, I guess oh, 27 or 8 years, it's longer than I like to think. <laughs> Happily, no doubt. Yes, right. right. Yeah. So you bring a, a long history of expertise to this uh, new program of the Bush administration called the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. Yes. Um, what is this about? Well, well, what is it about? There are a lot of things, uh, what they, there's what they say it's about, and if you ignore what they say and look at where the money is being spent, it's, there are two different things. The, the basic idea of the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership is that um, uh, we, the the administration and many other people see the, uh, a blossoming of nuclear uh, reactors uh, in response in large part to the uh, concerns about greenhouse gases. And so uh, they think the world is going to build lots of nuclear power plants. Now, part of the problem is, is that if uh, uh, you need to fuel these power plants, you need to uh, enrich uranium. That means increase the, the uh, concentration of the uranium-235, which powers the nuclear power plants, but also is the isotope that powers nuclear bombs. Uh, you can, at the end of the cycle, uh, uh, reprocess or chemically process the fuel and get plutonium out. And that could be used as a nuclear fuel, but it also can be used to power nuclear bombs. So now the, consider, the problem is, is that if we have this proliferation of nuclear reactors and the nuclear fuel cycle, when they talk about the fuel cycle, that's all the processing, the fuel before and after it goes into the reactor. Uh, there's worries that it will proliferate nuclear weapons. And so th this proposal is, is that those nations, of, of select few nations will, will become fuel suppliers. And the, we and a few other countries, we meaning the United States and a few other countries, will ship fuel to other uh, nations that want to have reactors but don't want to have the, be able to process the fuel. And then when the fuel has been irradiated uh, and it's spent, it will be shipped back to the providing country. And that's the f uh, basic idea, the, th the, the logical idea behind it. So what there was the platonic form of a program that was going to uh, be proliferation resistant, but then mm -hmm. the reality is a little bit different. Well, yeah, as I said, if you ignore what they say and you look to see where they're actually spending the money, what they're really, really pushing is this reprocessing part of the, uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, nuclear fuel cycle, to take this highly radioactive irradiated fuel out and to separate the plutonium out of that. 
Um, in fact, the basic premise of the uh, of of the GNEP, which is that other countries will ship their radioactive waste back to the United States. I brief lots of congressional staffs on this, and they just roll their eyes to the ceiling. They think that's a political non-starter. The idea that we're going to send fuel to uh, countries that might want to build reactors, whether it's you know, Korea or Indonesia or some place like that, and that uh, they're, uh, that's fine, but the fact that they're going to send their waste back to the United States, we have a hard enough time, both politically and technically, dealing with our own waste you know, other countries are going to send waste here is, I think, is is highly unrealistic. We had a guest here uh, last year, Sean Burney, who was a yes, uh, mm -hmm. an expert on radioactive waste issues, who formerly worked with Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. He's from Scotland, and he was pointing out that uh, the GNEP actually created a paradox mm -hmm. in terms of there are now more nations interested in acquiring nuclear stuff than would have been otherwise. Nations like Senegal, right. Ghana, <laughs> yes. it, Yemen. Mm -hmm. uh, has this been your experience too? Oh, absolutely. Part of what this is is that the, uh, the, the Bush administration uh, has proposed this plan which really divides the world into nuclear haves and have-nots. And so if you're on the team, then you get to become one of the supplier countries. But if once the uh, the gate is closed, then no no one else is allowed to do this, and uh, uh, you have to become one of the user countries. Moreover, according to the U.S., that the eventually this will be a profit-making uh, operation. I don't believe that'll ever be true, and I don't think many other people do either. So we have suppliers, and we You'd have, have users. You'd have suppliers and users. And there are other industries that use that terminology as yes, well. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's true. But the, uh, uh, the, the, the problem, of course, is, is that even if people are very skeptical, they think, well, I don't know, maybe these crazy Americans will get this to work. You know, maybe this will, this will happen. And so they want to make certain that they're on the right side of the fence before the gate is closed. Australia, for example, doesn't do any fuel reprocessing. Australia has huge reserves of uranium, and they export uranium ore, and they export uranium, but they don't do the enrichment. They don't manufacture the fuel rods and that sort of thing. They have no reactors also, is that correct? Uh, I think that that's true. I think mm -hmm. that that's true. I'm not, I have to say I'm not absolutely certain about mm -hmm. that. But uh, the, um, um, so the uh, Australians thought, well, we don't want to be locked out of this, so we are going to go on record that we are interested in becoming nuclear fuel suppliers, and they sign up for GNAP. It doesn't really mean very much. It's just that they're laying down a marker that if in the future this turns out to be uh, uh, viable, whether they believe it will be or not, it might be. And so they're on record as saying that they want to be on the inside of the fence before the gate is closed. Mm -hmm. And so now you have uh, 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 Australia uh, becoming a, a, a fan. And then the Secretary of Energy comes back to Washington waving a letter saying, oh, see, the Australians have signed up for this. It must be a good idea. And they, they use that as p uh, political theater back in Washington. And will he do the same when Yemen comes through? With the well, uh, there, <laughs> some bizarre countries have signed up to yeah. be part of this, you know, Kazakhstan and mm. strange yes. places uh, that you would not have thought. Uh, and it doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason except that it's just uh, uh, whoever you can get to sign the document. So it's kind of a strange nuclear neo-colonialism. Uh, well, in a sense, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to form a little country club and, and uh, with limited uh, membership, and so people want to get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, it is a perverse incentive. Now, you mentioned the, the double-edged sword here. Uh, there are different aspects of the GNAP program, but you, you clearly pointed out that while uh, the game plan was we would take other people's waste, mm -hmm. that we still have our own problem as well that we haven't resolved. So mm -hmm. what are these wastes that we're talking about that we're going to be taking back and... Uh, oh, well, the, uh, you know, it, uranium, which fuels nuclear reactors, is not particularly radioactive. I mean, it, it has, uh, it's, it's quite stable. You know, uranium-238 has a half-life of, of five billion years, the age of the Earth. So it, it undergoes radioactive decay very slowly. You know, you can handle hunks of uranium safely. What happens is that when it gets into the reactor, though, uh, through you induce a, a process of splitting these uranium atoms in two, uh, and they form what's called fission products. That process is called fission, after, you know, cells dividing in two is the fission. And uh, the, that nuclear ash that comes from the reaction, that's intensely radioactive, okay? 
And plus, some of the uranium will absorb neutrons that are in the reactor, and they form even heavier elements like plutonium and americium and curium. And these are also very dangerous and very radioactive. And so by sitting in the reactor, it becomes intensely radioactive, very, very dangerous. And now you have to, the, the material that comes out of the reactors, that's what they're proposing to reprocess and to separate out each of these different components so that uh, in theory you can handle them in a special way that uh, you know, would, would, will reduce the overall burden. Uh, it's one of these things that works uh, great in theory. The problem is with the economics and the, the engineering. I mean, the fact is that these, because these things are so uh, radioactive, everything has to be done by remote control uh, and robots. If some piece of machinery breaks, it's a huge deal to try to fix it, you know, because people can't go in and touch it. And uh, uh, it's just, it, it turns out to be fabulously expensive. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it, it's one of those ideas that on paper it's just really clever and a, you know, a scientist or an engineer just loves that kind of sweet solution. But then when you actually get down to it, it just turns out not to be practical. Reminds me of the old Einstein quote of a clever person solves a problem but a wise person avoids it. <laughs> well, um, that might, that's you, used, good. you used a term though that I think we should define a little bit more for the audience here. Uh, we might know about it but they may not. All right, so we're taking this highly intense radioactive fuel out of reactors now and reprocessing it. Mm -hmm. What is reprocessing? I'm sure it's not a monolith, like mm. we have different kinds of reactors. Are there different kinds of reprocessing and where is it being done? Well, there, right now there's only one kind of reprocessing that's done on a large scale, uh, and that is a, a process that was developed back in World War II by the Manhattan Project for the development of, uh, to get plutonium for nuclear bombs. It's something called Purex, or plutonium uh, uranium extraction. Mm -hmm. And uh, the current proposal is, is because of the danger of having uh, uh, pure plutonium that can be used with nuclear, uh, be used in weapons. Uh, the Department of Energy says, oh no, we're gonna develop a new process, and they kind of tweak the chemistry a little bit uh, so that you never get absolutely pure plutonium. It's, it's mixed with the uranium, so it wouldn't be as, as useful as a bomb. But, and they, they're very misleading in this case. They call it, their, their new process is proliferation resistant. Well, what they mean is that it's proliferation resistant compared to using the Purex process, which was developed specifically for building bombs. Mm -hmm. And so it's less proliferation prone than a bomb factory, but it is not proliferation resistant compared to what we do today, which is to leave the plutonium locked up in these fuel rods and, and protected by the, their own radioactivity. It's, it's an, I mean, radiation is a bad thing, but sometimes you can use it to your advantage. The International Atomic Energy Agency calls it self-protecting. These things are so radioactive that if you tried to steal one of these fuel rods, well, I mean, they weigh about a ton, so, you know, you would need to get another dozen bad guys, terrorists, to pull one out of a cooling pond or something at a reactor. By the time you could get to your, your truck and load it in the truck, you'd be dead. Okay. Game over. Mm -hmm. So that would, th that's actually a, a good thing. Um, if you just have the uranium and the plutonium, it's, it's not like it's safe. You don't want to lick it. But uh, it's, uh, it isn't so radioactive. And so you could put it in a bag. And, and plus, rather than having to steal a ton of it, now I have to steal 20 or 50 pounds of it. Okay? And then I can pr uh, do chemistry on that, separate out the plutonium. So the, the reprocessing has, has done 95% of my work for me, mm -hmm. rather than 100%. Now, you mentioned this was done after World War, during and after World War II mm -hmm. for bombs, mm -hmm. but the United States, are we doing this now? No, no, mm -hmm. we, uh, uh, the, the advantages of reprocessing really only come about if you build a new kind of, of nuclear reactor called a, a fast neutron reactor. And I say it's new, it's not really, uh, it's an idea that goes back to the late 40s, the very beginning of the nuclear age, and, and uh, we, meaning people in the world, you know, people, not, not the United States, uh, have invested over the last several decades about a hundred billion dollars in trying to build these reactors. And we've built experimental ones. We have, the British have, the French have, the Japanese have. We've built about 25 over the past uh, 60 years. Uh, and none of them have ever been commercially successful. To give you an idea of how the level of, of technical sophistication, we've never built two of the same type. Mm. 
So we had one of these reactors called Clinch River in Clinch River, Tennessee, and it was going to cost a half a billion dollars, and when it got up to about six billion dollars, we canceled that program. Mm -hmm. And so then we canceled the, uh, the reprocessing program. So, and Jimmy Carter was worried about the, uh, the, both the cost and the proliferation, thing, so he stopped the reprocessing program, and we haven't been reprocessing for th and what, 30 Jimmy years. Carter was the only president we had who had nuclear training. Yes, and the he nuclear was, Navy. Yeah, yeah, and he knew, uh, he, he, he knew a problem when he saw it, right. and the Clinch River now, was a problem. Now let's go back to the reprocessing itself for a minute, because the industry describes it as recycling, yet we're not doing it yes. here, but other mm -hmm. nations are. Is this the, really recycling? Well, they, they um, that's an interesting term. They used to, when the GNAP program first came out, they just called it reprocessing, the whole thing is reprocessing. And then they actually hired a public relations firm that had um, uh, focus groups, citizens focus groups, and they discovered that this word recycling really resonated, and that was a great way to mm -hmm. sell this program. If it's good for newspapers and aluminum cans, then how can it possibly be bad for mm -hmm. plutonium, right? And so what they, they, they make a distinction, reprocessing is the chemical process of getting the plutonium out, and then when I put it back in the reactor, they call that recycling. Uh -huh. And that, uh, that was uh, entirely an invention of, of this uh, public relations firm doing these focus groups. Nice. Was, uh, if you go back, uh, it was an interesting watch when the website changed. They, uh, the website, they before and after, uh, they just, Everywhere the word reprocessing uh, appeared, they just had cut and pasted and put in reprocessing mm -hmm. and recycling. Yeah. Now everyone talks about the French, the French model. Yes. How mm -hmm. good France does it, and France does do reprocessing. They do do reprocessing. Uh, I, we believe we yeah, have a graphic of the La Hague yeah. Center yeah. Uh, in mm -hmm. France, and uh, we'll put that up in a moment here. Um, what about the French process? Is it is it so pristine and clean that every like we hear about in the United States? Well, the French. Didn't and the British did exactly the same thing. Uh, they had a program like we did to have build these fast neutron reactors, mm -hmm. and both in France and Britain, uh, the reactor part of the program failed. And you would think that they would then cancel the reprocessing program. But you know, once you spend a few billion dollars, these programs just have a life of their own. They proceed with their own momentum. And so, both in France and Britain, they went ahead with the reprocessing. And as a result, now. The British have 100 tons of separated plutonium, and the French have 80 tons of separated plutonium, which they don't really know what to do with. But it reduced so the waste overall, didn't it? No, no, no. What they're doing, I mean, they've just separated it out. I mean, if, if So they if, have other wastes yeah, of uh, residue? Yeah, if I have a bag of, mm -hmm. of black and white marbles, and I separate them into black marbles and white marbles, I don't have fewer marbles. I just have two piles of marbles, uh -huh. right? We have a, a photograph, I think, of some mm -hmm. of these marbles that you're talking oh. about here from the <laughs> Yes. the French uh, cycle, they're and in waste barrels. Uh, and so what, what the French have done, they have this huge plant on the English Channel where they separate out the plutonium, they're collecting plutonium. Some of the plutonium they're trying to put back in through their current reactors without building these new fast neutron reactors mm -hmm. with limited success. But they basically have everything, all the waste is now just stored above ground. This is a, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really just a, uh, my own theory is that it, it is a political convenience, the, f the, the French have not started this process of trying to, f this political process of trying to find a permanent geological repository, the equivalent of our Yucca Mountain. And you can, everybody, whether you think Yucca Mountain is a good idea or a bad idea, everybody agrees it was a political nightmare. And you can think, if you're out in Nevada, it's a very arid, desolate place, nobody lives out there, and you can see the political problem we had putting it there. Imagine the political problem that a European country is going to have with the population mm -hmm. density of France. It's going to be a, a real knockdown, drag out fight. Or imagine Japan mm -hmm. or someplace. Now, I've heard news accounts that uh, the problem is not only on land, but uh, uh, we showed a graphic a moment ago of, of England and France's facilities that there have been some ocean uh, pollution yeah, well problems the, with this. The, both uh, the British plant is built on the Irish Sea and the French plant is built on the English Channel. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't um, uh, intentionally dump uh, nuclear waste into the sea just as a way to get rid of it. But in the normal chemical process, you know, nothing is 100 percent efficient. Uh, you're you don't, uh, and if you're 99.9% .9 efficient and you're handling a thousand tons of stuff, that means you know a ton of stuff is mm -hmm. is leaking sort of leaking through your fingers. Sort of and like so the, the little blobs on the graph yes, that we right. have. Yes, right. And they and so there there is uh, a easily measurable and significant 
uh, contamination both in the Irish Sea from the f British plant and in the English Channel. From Does it stay locally? Well, uh, you know, it, it's it's like anything. It's the highest concentration is where it's released, and then it drifts out, and the you know the concentration goes down as the area spreads out, and over time it will spread out further and further. So it's it's not a good situation at all now. So the situation in France is. Uh Again, the devil is in the details, and it's not as clean as we yeah, have heard before. Yeah, and they before. have different, mm -hmm. uh, there's a conflict between the British and the French because the, they have different standards uh, for what is acceptable, and the, mm -hmm. what the French are doing on their side of the English Channel, the, the British uh, would, would not, cons doesn't meet their standards of what's acceptable. Of course, then the British are having the same argument with the Irish on their side of the Irish mm -hmm. Sea, and so it, it all comes around. Well, let's bring it back to the U.S. now, because mm -hmm. um, we're going to be ending fairly soon here. What is the Federation's position on reprocessing, and what do you think, not just you personally, mm -hmm. but the Federation think, the United States should do with its radioactive waste? Well, the Federation is involved in this. Not We don't have a position on, on nuclear power. We're not pro or con nuclear power, but we are very much against reprocessing because of the danger of uh, nuclear proliferation that uh, the arguments the ad administration makes, the Department of Energy, that this is going to somehow reduce proliferation dangers, we think are uh, completely wrong. They're the opposite of the truth. So uh, uh, we oppose prolifer uh, we, pr we oppose uh, reprocessing because of proliferation dangers. Mm -hmm. The fact is, whether you're for or against nuclear power, you have to admit, even if you're against nuclear power, we have this waste that's there. Yucca Mountain is not opening. What should you do? Okay, and right. what what is the solution? Is the solution that we've kind of muddled our way forward to, which is now we are taking nuclear waste, and when the cooling ponds uh, get full, uh, the cooling ponds what are, are these. Cooling these ponds? The cooling Explain. ponds are at reactors. They're like a giant swimming pool, mm -hmm. and the, when the f fuel rods, the used fuel rods, come out, they're still producing a little bit of heat. Uh, not anything like what they're producing in the side of the reactor, but still, you can't just put them in a room and seal them up because the heat builds up over time, and so mm -hmm. you need to cool them, so they, they just dunk them in water for 10 years. Uh, then these cooling ponds are now filling up because there's no place. It, originally, we were going to send them to Yucca Mountain, which was supposed to open 10 years ago and hasn't. So. What uh, they do is put them in these dry casks, they call them. They're huge. Uh, I think we have a diagram of that that we okay. can put up. We have, they're these uh, concrete and stainless steel cylinders, and they put them out on just concrete pads now, uh, and those will be stable for at least a century. You could improve that significantly by hardening them, for example, just digging them down a little bit, Don't you know, not burying them, but just putting them below grade level so if somebody wanted to shoot an anti-tank missile at them or something, they wouldn't be able to do that, or put them behind earthen berms and then putting a roof over to keep the ice and snow off. And these would be stable for long enough. It might turn out in 50 years that reprocessing is a good idea and we'll have the technology that'll do it. And then we would have these, uh, we could open up these casks and that would provide the raw material. Or we might figure out uh, some geological repository. You know, it might not be Yucca Mountain, but someplace we're going to have to find someplace eventually. And then we could move them uh, there when the time is appropriate. So currently, uh, in the United States, the approach is we're aiming towards a geological repository someplace. You've, we, whatever you do, eventually you have to have some geological repository for the nuclear waste. You can't avoid it, and you can you can think it's a bad idea, but you there's just no other alternative. We've got the waste already. Now you might say that was a big mistake. We should never have built the first nuclear reactor. But the fact is we have uh, tens of thousands of tons of the waste, then you have to do something with it. Well, even if you're against nuclear power, that doesn't mean this stuff just magically goes away. It's there. So you've got to do something with it. And, and even with the reprocessing, uh, you will have to have some kind of geological repository to put the waste in. So it sounds for the intermediate time period we're stuck with storage on site, and it has to be done responsibly. I think that that is, uh, and when you say intermediate, for the next uh, few to several decades, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the methods we would use would be the spent fuel pools to the dry cask. To the dry cask, and then protect the dry cask so that if an airplane crashes on them or terrorists try to blow one up, that they will not be able to do that or it minimizes the consequences of that. Uh, this is a very sensitive time. issue in Illinois, uh, for example, where we are now because of the 
fact that we have a closed reactor mm -hmm. at Zion, north of Chicago, which yes. is on the shores of Lake mm -hmm. Michigan at the same right, time. Right. The waste is still there, but the reactors are gone. Yeah, that's a more complicated. One, one of the reasons that, that we advocate this uh, uh, dry cask storage on site is because you, at a nuclear reactor, you already have security. You have a fence around the site. You have s guards there. You have to have a of an evacuation plan and all these things because there's a nuclear reactor there. So the additional cost and hazard of storing the, the waste there is tiny compared to the what you're already having to do for the reactor itself. Now, I admit it's a more complicated situation if you want to close down a reactor and dis you know not just close it down, but dismantle it, clean up the site, and there's waste stored there. What do you do? Should you leave it there or should you move it? Then you have, there's a, there's a risk of, of it being at any site, but there's also risk of transportation. And those are much more complex and, and uh, depend on a much uh, more complex case-by-case -case analysis. For example, in the case of Zion, and you know, I'm not from Illinois, I'm from Washington, so I don't know the local conditions so well, but as I understand it, it's very close to the shores of, of Lake Michigan. And that might fold into your calculation of the risks of leaving it there versus the risk mm -hmm. of transportation. You might want to move it to another nuclear reactor site, okay, where you have the security and the fences and all that, and, and the guards. Um, I don't really know. I'd have to look in detail at that mm -hmm. particular case. Now we only have about a minute left. Does the Federation itself have a recommendation or opinion about what the federal government should do about the GNAP program? Well, if you wanted to to do some low-level research on uh, laboratory-scale research on on uh, fuel reprocessing, I think it'd be difficult to argue against that, but certainly any plans for doing any kind of commercialization, any large demonstration, is literally decades premature. Mm -hmm. If it ever becomes a good idea, it won't become a good idea until the second half of the century. And your opinion on this? On um, the ec because of the economics. Okay. Illinois has a, a ban on constructing new reactors until mm -hmm. we have a responsible solution for the waste. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Oh, this is not a responsible solution for waste. This is a, a uh, a just so story that w would <laughs> allow you to believe that you might have a responsible solution for the waste in the All future, right. but it's not. All right, well, we'll have to end on that note. Okay. I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Ivan Ulrich, for joining me tonight. You've been watching CAN TV Community Forum, a community service of CAN TV. Tune in to Community Forum for local issues and concerns every Saturday from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on CAN TV 21. I'm Dave Kraft, and I thank you for joining us. I thank you. Thanks.